all, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. This is our second lecture in our series in which, uh, because of our 40th anniversary, we've asked our faculty members to uh, come and present their most interesting or recent research. And today we have the pleasure of uh, uh, listening to Dr. Koch. And this is also special because Dr. Koch is actually a graduate of the American Studies Center. Uh, in 1999, he got his MA. He is one of the first uh, uh, alumni. Uh, he also got his PhD from the University of Wuchi in 2001. In 2015, uh, he got his habilitatia. So now he's a, uh, he's a professor. Um, an associate professor at our university, he's an author of two critical books Robert Lowell's Uncomfortable Epigon of the Grand Matter. Grand Matter. Uh, Robert Frost, Political Body, 2014, also a co-editor of two collections of essays, Tools of Their Tools, and the Transatlantic 60s Europe and the United States in the Counterculture Decade. Recently, he has contributed essays to Robert Frost Review and Robert Frost in uh, Context. In 2009, he was a full visiting scholar at the University of Chicago, more recently a recipient of two major research grants, from the Polish National Science Center, also a very active member of the academic community. He's the founder, uh, former president of the Robert Frost Society, and currently a member of the executive board of this society. Um, something very interesting, Dr. Koch has always been interested in archival research, something kind of unique for a literary scholar, more historian, uh, historian interest. Frequent traveler to archival libraries, uh, for example, um, Houghton, and I just correct the name, it's Houghton. Houghton. Uh, in Cambridge, Howard Gottlieb in Boston, Harry Ransom in Austin, Albert and Shirley Small in Charlottesville, uh, Rauner, Rauner, Rauner in Hanover, New Hampshire. Presently, he's co editing with Stephen uh, Gold Axelrod from the University of California, Riverside, a new two volume edition of Robert Lowell's Prose, Robert Lowell's Memoirs, and Robert Lowell's Critical Prose. Uh, for his critical work, he's working on a volume of essays explaining the subject of American poets performing political speeches. So we have uh, something on the border of poetry, literature, and politics, something very interesting, and also a very interesting um, aspect of archival historical research, which I, which I hope we will hear a little bit about today. Uh, the title of today's lecture, Revalancing the... No? Yes, okay. This title. Editing Robert Lowell's The Imbalanced Aquarium. That's the shorter version. I had a, I had a, I had a, a, a longer version here. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jegoshko. Thank you. 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 Uh, first uh, things first, uh, let me say that I'm working um, on this project jointly with Stephen Gold Axelrod, a distinguished professor of English from the University of California, Riverside. We're both, it's interestingly enough, we're both supported generously in this research uh, uh, by the Polish, Polish National Science Center. Um, uh, I've changed the title, as you can see, though I will be talking about how Stephen and I revisit the archival sources for a new text of Lowell's prose. That's what we do. So, I guess I should start by mentioning this book. This is Robert Lowell's Collected Prose. Robert Lowell's Collected Prose. It came out in 1987. It was published by Lowell's traditional publisher, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. I'm sure you've heard of this publisher. It's a famous publisher. It received, this book received mixed reviews, but it had been in, in print until recently. It's widely used by, the, by general readers, by students of American poetry, by students of American confessional poetry, by scholars, by professionals as well. Now, Stephen, Stephen Axelrod and I have an arrangement with Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, uh, Lowell's tradition publisher, that we will put together a new edition, a new edition of Lowell's prose, possibly in two volumes, we don't know yet. 
we, we, we're not sure if we have enough material, good material, strong material for a new volume. But this, this book of ours will replace, will replace the 1987 book. Okay? That's what we did. That's what we've been doing for the last three years. Now, <clears throat> the old collected prose of, eight, of 1987 is the product of the editorial decisions of this man, okay? Robert Giroux. Uh, here's a picture of him precisely in the fall of, 18, of 1987. The, the volume that he's just published is, is right uh, uh, behind him. Um, he's a legendary editor. He launched the careers of Kerouac, Flannery O'Connor, Gene Stafford, it goes on and on. Ma Bernard Malamut, William Gaddis, Susan Zontag, um, Isaac Bashevis Singer, Derek Walcott, Nadine Gordimer, Seamus Heaney, Golding, William Golding, the author of, of The Lord of, La of the Flies, and Solzhenitsyn. Do you see? So he, he is legendary. And I think it's important for you to understand that we're putting together a book that will replace a book edited by a legend. Okay? That's why we need to know, uh, that's why we need to know everything. That's why we need to know um, uh, how he did his volume, what went wrong with the volume, how it went wrong and why it went wrong. Do you see? We need to know everything about this volume and about this man to come up with a volume that will be good enough to replace his. Okay? Now, we spent a long time at the Houghton Library at Harvard examining Robert Lowell's typescripts and have decided that Robert Giroux's edition of this book, of this, it's a long, it's a, it's a long, a long uh, memoir. Uh, we've decided that Robert Giroux's edition of this memoir, it's a widely admired autobiographical piece, which Robert Giroux edited. It makes a very different reading than the ribbon typescript, the balanced aquarium. You see, I look, we looked for this near the unbalanced aquarium. We ended up finding this, the balanced aquarium at the Houghton, the Archival Library of Harvard College. Now, we collated, compared the two texts, the edited text and the text we found. And it now seems to us that the editor seriously misedited misedited Lowell's work. By all appearances, he cut as many as seven crucial pages from the middle. Okay? He cut seven pages, crucial pages from the middle. He missed four other pages. One from near the beginning and three from the end. By the way, by the way, he was unaware of their existence. He underappreciated the value of some motifs in the sections he had retained and he also arbitrarily cut them. Even more whimsically, he concocted the ending. He concocted the ending, bringing in other fragments or just bits and pieces from other miscellaneous pages. Okay? Finally, as you can see, he changed the title dramatically. He made all those dramatic changes to the serious detriment of the text's overall meaning. Okay? Now, <clears throat> in his introduction, Giroux wrote that near the unbalanced aquarium, this is what he said about the text he edited, is a self-contained and finished section of Lowell's autobiography, which bears the title the poet gave it. Honest to God, that's what he, what he writes in the introduction. Yeah, right. For him to say that what he did, he, that he's publishing largely what he's found in the archive, could not have been more inaccurate. It could not have been more inaccurate. He is mistaken on everything. 
on the title's wording, and he says nothing about the radical changes he made. We, we even think he probably is wrong that the balanced query was to be part of a larger autobiography. I th we think he was wrong on that too. It is certainly true that the balanced query, the text that we found, held that the Houghton is self-contained and fairly finished. Um, however, four pages of the text are misfiled. Four pages of the text are misfiled. By March 1956, Lowell's wife said in a letter to the editors of one magazine, wrote, describes the, described the text as already written in a good draft, already nearly done, needing only to be revised for the last time. Now, the title of the title near the unbalanced aquarium, if you think about it, is now a strangely apt symbol of what Giroud did. Uh, Robert Giroux may have been an editor of great instinct and, an out, and of outstanding promotional skills. And I can recommend to you a book that, that is a bestseller in New York City now as, as, I, as I'm speaking um, from this from this rose room. It's called Hot House, Hot House by Boris Kachka. This idea that, at, that Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux is a hot house of talent. But in this particular case, as a textual editor, he piled error on error. Okay? All those omissions and edits changed the original's meaning dramatically. Robert de Giroux distorted the text, which, read in full, seems more revealing in terms of both its psychological nature, the role the text was to play in Lowell's recovery at some point. I mean, you should know you should know that Robert Lowell was what was ill, was mentally ill, seriously mentally ill, and the story was meant to have been recovered. Importantly, we, I will show that the editor's radical change changes seem ill-advised, and this is something that I want you to understand. They, all the changes he made, we think we made, seem ill-advised because those changes, and I'm going to say that very slowly so that it would it would sink. All the changes seem ill-advised because they disregard the only way in which the poet could presumably have delegated his intention to Giroud. Okay? They are ill-advised because they, his changes disregard the only way in which the poet could presumably have delegated his intention to Giroud. See, see, uh, Lowell worked with Giroud all his life. Uh, it won't do to show that Giroud did some cuts. Do you see? They knew each other very, very well. We need to show that those cuts would have been unacceptable to Lowell. You see? As editors, we need to show that those cuts would have been unacceptable to Lowell that they were different from what they would have done working together, okay? So instead of assisting Lowell's work in that way, that the poet would have probably welcomed, the edits work precisely in the opposite direction. So we, our task is to show that the kind of editorial cuts he did would have been unacceptable to Lowell, okay? They knew each other very, very well. It just won't do to say, uh, Giroud misedited the text, right? Because there was this, there was this strong understanding between them. Ultimately, we argue that those edits reveal Giroud's, and, and this is another point. We will argue, and you will show me, you will see me argue that Giroud's body, that all the edits, all the changes show. Jerusalem's bias against the idea of Lowell's recovery and periodic stability. Okay? The cuts he did show him biased against the idea that Lowell will, would ever get well. That's our second point. Okay? So, and the whole, the whole lecture will be about that. That the changes 
where the kind of changes that he would not, never have accepted had he lived to see them. And our second point is that those changes show Giroud biased against the idea that Lowell would ever recover. Okay, and, and then toward the end, I will we speculate on the history, on their personal history, that may have underlain this somewhat insensitive attitude. Do you see? That's my plan. Okay. In principle, Giroud's reductions should have a great, great textual authority because he was Lowell's lifetime editor. As this picture shows, this is Lowell, this is Robert Giroud, and this is Lowell's first wife. As this picture shows, he was associated with Lowell almost from the very beginning of the poet's career. They met early, I think, I, we think as early as 1941, through Jean Stafford, through Jean Stafford, when Giroud was about to become her editor. She, was, she became a famous writer too. Soon afterwards, he became Lowell's editor as well, helping the poet publish his second volume, uh, which would get them both a Pulitzer Prize. Okay? So this was a largely harmonious cooperation. And this was a largely harmonious cooperation also because Giroux as an editor, who as an editor felt far more comfortable with prose. Remember the names of the authors he promoted? Malamed, Singer, Solzhenitsyn. Um, <clears throat> um, Giroux was much more comfortable with prose than poetry, and he rarely tried to intervene editorially into Lowell's poetic work. There is almost no evidence for the claim that Lowell, as long as he was alive, ever had to fight with Giroux to defend his authorial intention. We know, we know that only in 1915, the poet tried to revise the galley proofs of his third volume, against Giroux's warnings that they would have to charge Lowell extra money for those late revisions. Now, Giroux's efficiency as a publisher and a promoter, as well as his neutrality as an editor, probably combined to make the poet want to stand by him. So we, can, we know that Lowell always wanted to work with Giroux. You see, that's what we are against as editors. You see, that's what we work we were against as editors. Lowell was ready to leave it even Harcourt Brace and Company, a famous publisher. When in 1955, Giroux left Harcourt Brace and Company for Farmer Straws and Kudahi, the publisher we're working with now. Lowell writes, would you like to buy me, to buy out my old stuff from Harcourt and Brace? The poet asks um, Giroux in one letter. Or, or would you like to do whatever is necessary for you to publish my new poems? I don't know anyone really at Harcourt and Brace and would like to stick with you. Do you see? So that's what we're against. We're, we're against a, a very harmonious relationship between the poet and his editor. And we're, we're putting together a book that will dethrone his. Do you see? That will dethrone his. However, in case of his prose, as opposed to his poetry, Lowell was likely to seek and accept Jules' revisions. Okay? True, Lowell may have felt periodic unease at Jules' proclivity for trimming prose, for readability. Um, <clears throat> um, but Lowell certainly appreciated Jules' skill to improve texts, clarity, and lucidity. Do you see? What he liked about Giroux was that Giroux could make a text clear and lucid. And remember, Lowell was mentally ill. Okay? At least once he appeared dismayed, that Lowell appears dismayed, that his sense of what well-developed prose meant could be so at variance of what Giroux considered finished and well-developed. Okay, so most importantly, Lowell would have sought Giroud's help with his prose for ethical and psychological reasons. Lowell sought, Lowell sought Giroud's help 
for ethical and psychological reasons. Poetry made Lowell overly excited. Do you see? Poetry made Lowell overly excited, but plain and simple language in prose, setting up the subject, the glosses, the links connecting moments of drama, all these things uh, that helped socialize the text were something that Lowell welcomed in collaboration. Do you see? So, um, to, to make a long story short, Lowell believed that prose is saner. And he sought help with prose as text, as text that is sane, as a genre that is saner. He sought help from somebody, from Bob Giroux, whom he calls sober. In another letter, he calls him cautious. In still another, he calls him an old maid. An old maid. The poet saw the editor as possessing traits of character, which he, visited as he was by bouts of mania, sometimes wished to have. For similar reasons, he sometimes sought Elizabeth, his, his second wife's help, with corrections and revisions. His autobiographical prose, too, was revised at some point by his second wife. So you see, the point I'm trying to make, we're trying to make, is that Lowell sought editorial help with his prose, and he thought of his editors as bringing more sanity to the text, as bringing more sanity to the text. Sanity that he didn't have. Okay. So, for example, there's one, there's the best developed version of another piece has quite many handmade revisions by his second wife, Elizabeth Hardy. Usually these are clarifications of various length, from single word insertions to additional sentences. Now, we've got a copy of the Balanced Aquarium, too, in which we find corrections made not by Lowell, but by somebody else. We don't think it was Giroux, however. We think it was, again, Lowell's second wife. And these corrections are kind of um, significant. On one page, Lowell's helper, whoever that person was, struck a comma, strongly suggesting a non-restrictive clause. On another, on another page, the person indicates a spelling error. On still another, he or she fixed the tense of a sentence, a misplaced modifier, and so. You see, this idea, I guess that I'm pushing for this idea that Lowell's editors made his texts lucid. The, now, my point is that the way in which the editor, Giroux, appropriated, appropriated the poet's intention in 1986, when he was putting together a 1987 book, runs precisely counter to every reason for which Lowell would have sought Giroux's editorial help. Okay? Now, uh, this is uh, the Balanced Aquarium, as we found it in the, in the archives at the Houghton Library. See? Pages from 1 to 28. 28 sheets, 28 pages, 28 pages. So that's the visualization of the copy text we found at Harvard. It's entitled The Balanced Aquarium. And The Balanced Aquarium and Giroux's version, near The Unbalanced Aquarium, are versions of an account of Lowell's days at the Payne Whitney Clinic in Manhattan, where in 1954 he was undergoing occupational therapy. So in 1954, he was confined to a mental hospital in Manhattan, Payne Whitney Clinic. The treatment was, and he was, he was subjected to a very specific treatment, it was called occupational therapy. The treatment was to help him stabilize his self through self-defined goals uh, and practical accomplishments achieved over temporary difficulties and small failures. It was to help him restore his mental health, of course. Uh, which, according to Lowell, his mental health was wrecked by um, his unhappy childhood, which haunts him through various episodes involving his parents. Um, those flashbacks and, 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 and the story, and this story describes him in the hospital uh, visited repeatedly by flashbacks 
of his, of his parents' last days or of his parents' funerals. Those flashbacks suggest that his mental disorder is rooted in the thoroughly asymmetrical and therefore dysfunctional role models of his two parents. So basically, his father was laughably weak. His mother was terribly scary and over-dominating. Okay? But that's not what we find in Giroux's collected prose. Now, I tried to visualize the published text removing from this grid all the pages that he cut. Do you see? That's what he did. Those are, say, all the pages missing here are the pages he cut. So that's actually the story he published. Okay? And we've got this, the big question is, why did that? Why did that? And we'll have to prove that he was wrong in knowing this to the text. Okay? Now, let me remind you, um, Lowell's wife, Elizabeth Hardwick, wrote in a letter to the, to the editors of Partisan Review, the text is nearly done. Right? It did not survive the cuts. Much of it did not survive the cuts of Jew. And we'll have to show that Giroux um, erred in this. <coughs> okay, so this architecture is, see again, notice that page two is missing. Okay, we found pa page two. We found page two. This architecture is disrupted at the very beginning of Giroux's version because the editor missed an important page, um, page two of the manuscript, which confusingly wound up in another folder of the Harvard collection, containing drafts written a few years later. In the original conception, that very page, this page, was to transport us immediately to his flashback of one nightmarish incident, namely his mother, invading rooms that Lowell thought with his father were their own. I mean, these were the rooms which mother was not supposed to enter. Okay? Uh, it's it, what Lowell calls it father's den. Masculine rooms. Brown and blue rooms. And she entered those rooms, quote, in her pink sli slippers, a pale pink nightgown, a pale pink woolen throw-over, and a pale pink lace nightcap. Her wrapper, coral pink, was decorated with blanched and masked pink threadwork. So, his pink mother entered, pink, you know, dressed in pink, um, entered rooms that he thought were for men. The sections set up sets up the context for all subsequent conflict between the feminine and the masculine. In boys in the boy's frantic grasping for a stable male identity, mother's pink is at war with father's blue and brown. Um, let me quote Lowell writes, I felt like pushing in all directions with my arms and making pink stay put in mother's bedroom. One way to get around mother was to think of man's colors, blue and tan, brown. Father's chair was leather and oak. So this page, and you know, my point is, so he missed this page. I don't think he cut this page. I mean, we don't think he cut this page. We think we missed it. He simply missed it. Uh, now, he missed this page, and notice but this page prepares the reader for all the subsequent descriptions of the father's rooms. Um, the page also anticipates and prepares the ground for the related correlates. The effeminate colors and the feminine symbols conflicting with the masculine symbols. The fire and the water. The wild and the subdued the mother's Victorianism and the father's modernism, 
the, um, the Victorian architecture in the modernist design. In his efforts to make mother stay put, Lowell imagines himself as a tower of muscle rushing into air and water. You see, he is so, he, is, um, he, he finds this visit by his mother into the, into the room that he thought belonged to men. And were men's territory. He, found, he finds it most traumatic. traumatic. Uh, <clears throat> okay, now let me show you how, this is, notice this is page three. And notice the various cuts Giroud did on page three. Now, one thing you need to remember, he never saw page two about the mother invading, pink-dressed mother invading the rooms which belonged to men. Look at that. He cut the sentence, I remembered the red storm lights and the brown tobacco spaces of night in the city skies. Uh, he cut all the sentences referring to colors because he didn't, never saw page two and therefore he misunderstands. He simply is not getting it. What is happening on page three? And he does the cuts that should be read as is deeply symbolic and suggesting this war. Notice red and brown tobacco cut, you see? The war between colors. The war between colors standing for the for the world of men and the world of women, for the feminine, for the men, for the for the masculine and the feminine. So Giroux seems not to be getting it when he cuts Lowell's sentence about his writing as an effort to use onion skin typing paper ink and royal blue abracadabra water to cover the pink of his fingers. Notice, notice he uses paper, royal blue abracadabra of the blotter and onion skin paper to conceal the pink pads of my fingers. Do you see? It's a very it's a very interesting war between two gendered identities and between and between and, and between colors symbolizing them. And Giroux, never seeing page two, begins to cut various sentences on page three, especially those which are legible once you see page two. See? Sentences referring to colors and to that to that conflict between genders. Okay, so that's page three. Now, so I'm done with page two. This is the part I'm most interested in. Okay, most relevantly, in the middle of the original text, Lowell embarks on those pages. Lowell embarks on a sustained project to place the father figure at the center of his memory. Now, one critic calls these pages a counter-strategy for the powerfully masculine identification of the self, so as to decenter the threatening, castrating, self-engulfing mother figure. Okay? So, it's a, again, let me read that again. It's a kind of a sustained project to place the memory of the father at the center of his identity. The whole piece, the whole piece was begun, begun as a kind of therapy, and arguably these, this part, these pages from 10 to 16, from 10 to 16, those pages was to be the story's most important part. Curiously, this was the part that Giroud cut from the text to create his text near the unbalanced query. Okay? At the heart of the story, Lowell recalls his father, and it's, it's a really interesting passage, this one. We found it, this is at Harvard, at the Houghton Library. He describes his father's uh, emphatic change of dress, as he puts it, which his father began to wear shortly before his death an imported English cream-colored dinner jacket and an indigo silk cummerbund. 
the poet saw this outfit, and, and for much of his life he thought of his father as very, very weak. And just days before he died, he began to wear this very, very elegant and powerful, pow powerful outfit that made him look like, like a different person. And like a, form, like a, like a much more manly person than, than as Lowell had remembered him. So Lowell also, <clears throat> Lowell calls this evening when he saw his father so elegant, the final triumphant and surprising flower of his evolution. The father looked, I'm quoting Lowell, from the pages that Giroux cut, as if lordly, tropical, colonial. He had stepped out of Bruce Brothers into an illustration for Conrad Kipling, her mom. Bob Lowell seemed to him blindingly potent. See, his father seems to him on those pages blindingly potent. Canceling the ignominy of all the days when, he, when the father seemed pathetic and weak. A symbol of self-control and self-confidence. Smiling, you know, Lowell would usually make fun of his father's smile. But on those pages he describes his, his father as not smiling the oval Lowell smile, but the Cheshire cat smile. Um, Cheshire cat smile. Uh, you know, showing teeth and gums, and showing what one critic wrote, detached intelligence. A trim figure, an efficient hairless head, a Cheshire cat. The poet concludes with one more shocking, surprising compliment my father might have posed as General Eisenhower. Really strange for Lowell to write that, because he, much of it, many texts, um, many uh, pieces from, from his writing are really um, satires, uh, ridiculing his father, showing how weak he was, showing how pathetic he was. But you see, at the heart of this story, and this story was meant as a therapeutic story, there is this uh, admiring portrait of the father. Okay? Now, <clears throat> there are moments when it seems that the project to envision the father as strong shows strength. And this is just an excerpt from the, from, the, from the seven pages which are missing. In the Houghton typescript, we find Lowell secretly savoring the sonnet he had written in tribute to his father, apparently seeking to place Commander Robert Lowell at the center of his identity. But strangely, Lowell writes its first and last line. So on the pages that are missing, we find Lowell trying to write a poem about his father, and this poem is not complete. And he says, I wrote only the first and the last line. Now, some critics have seen the manuscripts, the typescripts, and here's what they wrote. One critic wrote that the sonnet's incomplete is evidence for the psychological difficulties Lowell incurred trying to make the father figure central in his identity. You see? So he tried, but he failed. He tried, but he failed. Right? Notice the, our point is that this passage, those seven pages are important because he succeeds in promoting his father figure as manly and therefore as, some, as somebody who, who, whose m memory uh, promises uh, mental health. Okay. So, <clears throat> the writing of the poem, they suggest, seems disrupted. And some critics have seen those pages and, uh, and they wrote that the writing of the poem seems disrupted due to Bob Lowell's evasive and ephemeral presence in the poet's memory. The identification with the commander could not find expression in the poem and had to rely on other more phantasmal associations with another uh, figure, Prince Scharnhorst, whom I will discuss later on. But I think the most important thing is some people might say, well, maybe Robert Giroux didn't think this part is particularly interesting. After all, if, even if Lowell tried to set, to place his father at the center of his imagination, even if he tried to re-describe him as masculine, um, 
he clearly failed. Well, it's really interesting, but uh, we found at Harvard a page with the poem, and it's complete. Um, so the critics who wrote about this failure did not know this poem, the, the full poem, the song. And they were not, they were unaware that it, this is, this, this was the first and the last line of the poem Lowell actually did write and probably knew by heart. One, uh, one whose at least two drafts are also part of the Lowell collection at the Houghton Harvard College. The two lines enclosing the sonnet in the Balance Aquarium, then, they are not, those two lines are not a psychologically troubled, failed attempt at identification with the father, but rather those two lines were only a shorthand notation, a token of a very stable sentiment. Okay? Um, this is a poem that I'm not sure I have time to discuss. Very briefly, um, I was, we were particularly interested in, in the lines, um, I prize, Lowell writes, I prize the life you whittled to routine. Once again, we realize that at the heart of the balanced aquarium, the poet cultivates the powerful father figure. The father in the poet is not the pathetic bath dweller, um, booming anchors away. You know, anchors away is a famous song of the of the navy, and his father, who was presented as a loser repeatedly and sort of um, <clears throat> routinely, um, he he decides he's persuaded to to leave the navy for work at a at a at a one company. Of course, he turns out to become he turns out to, to be a great business failure. But he was, when he was leaving uh, the Navy, uh, Lowell describes him as taking a bath and <clears throat> in a bathtub and booming anchors away. Basically, I'm leaving the Navy. He, and it's, it's a famous, pathetic image of the father. So this is a man, and this poem suggests this was a man who, when young, not only had the courage to sail as far as China on a U.S. Navy ship, but also had the integrity to deny himself the easy pomp of being a U.S. commander and the law. He could see through the shams of his Boston milieu, was able to foresee in the early 1920s the Great Crash. This is what the poem suggests. This was a man who, who who was able to foresee the great crash. This was a man who had none of the pretentiousness that other men had uh, from his milieu. Uh, he was a man also who wanted to live his life modestly, precisely because he understood that its significance was modest. You see? And this is what I write about, what, what we write about, commenting on the line, I prize the life you whittled to routine. routine. So in other words, this poem is this great tribute to the father, right? Uh, for many years, critics thought that those two lines show low or fail. We found a, the poem in full, and it shows only that this is not a failure. Rather, he knew the poem by heart. He had a very strong memory of the poem. He simply he may have, it may have been his secret identity, you see? He may have been secretive about it. But what is important, this was not an emotional failure, right? Because he actually did write a poem that was a tribute to his father. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now here's the big question. Can we prove that Giroux cut the middle intention? You know, this is archival research. You run into pages, into some sheets by accident, but pages are, may, may have been missing when he was working on, on it. Do you see? 
So we not only, we, you know, it just won't do for us to say, well, he missed his pages. No. For to have the full understanding of what happened when he was editing his 1987 book, we need to find evidence that he found those seven pages and he put them away. Do you see? That he found them and he put them away. Is it possible that the editor did not cut those seven pages deliberately, but that they were missing from the same batch like some of the others? See, sometimes editors must engage in detective work. Possible it is, but it is also quite implausible. It's possible, but quite implausible. The pages of the manuscripts are clearly numbered, contiguously, so he would have noticed a seven-page gap. In fact, he seems to silently acknowledge in his edition there's a, there's a small gap where the seven pages should, should fall. In fact, he seems to acknowledge in his edition that the text is disrupted at this point for he signals the gap with an extra space line. Suppose, however, those very pages were actually missing from the batch and he, on, with this space, he simply signals only it's the text's regrettable incompleteness. What would any editor have done in such circumstances? Of course, he or she would have looked for the missing pages. You see? Suppose they were missing from the batch he found. Okay? They're not there. What do you do? Well, look for them. And Giroux had a number of resources to locate them. See, that's, that's how we are arguing. We have no evidence. We, you know, there were no, there was no, there were no um, cameras installed at the Harvard, at the Houghton Library back then. We don't know what he did with those seven pages. Um, um, but if those pages were missing, he should have looked for them. And there were plenty of ways to look for them and to find them effective. Okay. A few words on the orderliness of the collection would help. The cataloging of the collection began, it was purchased in 1973. The collection was purchased, uh, quote, in superb order. Okay? Then, 1975, the cataloging of the collection completed. And, I, and we know the catalog, and the catalog mentions those seven pages. Okay? Now, the 1981, the collection is put on a microfilm where the, uh, where the middle section is in place. Okay? So there is a, actually there is a microfilm with, with those 28 pages. Is the middle section there? Yes, there is. Do you see? So in other words, and here's when Giroud begins his research, 1985. Giroud working with the collection. Where is the middle section? It's not there. All of a sudden. It was there in 1973. It was there in 1975. The, catalog, the, the author of the catalog saw it and lists them. It was there in 1981 because the microfilm is still there. And by the way, Giroud may have used, except for the, in, uh, um, um, may have used the microfilm, not the, not the original. Or he may have consulted the microphone. Let's see if the, if the pages are there. He never did any such thing. And we started, well, we started our research around 2000. See? Where is the middle section? And it's back, it was back in the, in the, in the, in the batch starting from 2000. Uh, from 2000. To make, a long short, to make a long story short, the seven-page fragment missing from the Giroux edition was part of the manuscript in 1979 when the cataloging was completed. It, it was began in 1975, right? It was still there in 1981 when the microfilm was being made. It was on microfilm in its folder when Giroux was doing his research. And its presence 
was indicated all the time he was at the, he was at the reading room. He was in the reading room. He could have reached for the catalog and said, "Yes, the pages are part of the collection." Do you see? So, so the pages seem to have disappeared from the folder when Giroux was working on it. The pages seem to have disappeared from the folder when Giroux was working on it. And they, and they seem to have reappeared in the folder as soon as he was finished. As soon as he was finished. Also, he seems to have made no effort whatsoever to look for them, even though he had great resources at hand to locate them quickly. They, he had a full catalog. It's a very detailed catalog. Of course, one should always regard evidence skeptically. But to believe the scenario that Giroux published an incomplete version of the Balanced Aquarium because the seven pages were missing is not to be a skeptic at all. Right? To believe that they were simply missing is not to be a skeptic at all. A far more plausible explanation is that he simply put those pages aside. Most importantly, Deliberate cutting of the seven pages seems radical, but in a way not out of line with Giroux's attitude toward the manuscript, revealed in other numerous cuts, minor and major he made, ranging from single words, you know, you can see him cut um, single words, sentences, fragments made of several sentences, even entire paragraphs. Okay. So, the largest deletion, those seven pages, distorts Lowell's account of how he tried to reimagine his identity formation through the construction of a stronger father figure. Giroux's version alters the dynamic of Lowell's negotiating between the two paternal figures, making father more marginal and less consistently constructed as, in fact, embodying power and charisma. The editor seems to have remained oblivious to the text's consistent and deliberately fashioned narrative of recovery. Do you see? So it's kind of interesting that, remember, he wrote this text about him being subject to occupational therapy. And he strongly suggests that writing this text was also part of his therapy. At the heart of the poem, are seven pages describing his father, strangely enough, as a powerful figure. And Giroud removed those seven pages from the story and published it without them. Published the text without them. Okay? All the evidence, most of the evidence, all the evidence we've seen so far suggests that. We've not, we're not done yet. We, we're still uh, waiting for a larger batch of photocopies from New York Public, New York um, Public Library. They happen to have the entire Farrar Strauss and Giroux archive. Uh, we wonder whether the evidence that will arrive will subvert our narrative. Okay. okay, now the above hypothesis that he did not want to see in the text. The story of recovery is corroborated by the significant alteration he made in the title. Near the unbalanced aquarium seems a small change from Lowell's version, the balanced aquarium. Now notice we found the early, the early galleys, the first galleys of Giroux's book. And notice, notice this, those were the first galleys of Giroux's book near the balanced aquarium. Near the unbalanced aquarium was a last minute change. You know, it's a big, big mystery. What happened? Um, what happened um, during those four months separating the first galleys from the final galleys? You see? But he changed the title to, to say unbalanced aquarium rather than balanced aquarium. <clears throat> now, so this is a small change, but it's just serious enough to reveal Giroux's inclination 
to see Lowell as mainly troubled and incapable of recovery. See? Uh, this is, by the way, one draft uses the, that uses the preposition near and sort of creates a sense of ambivalence. If that sense of ambivalence may have led Schubert to feel that imputing to the poet a greater emotional instability will still be within the range of what Lowell meant. Because one of the versions is entitled Near the Balance Query. At no point Lowell goes so far, does Lowell go so far as to say near the unbalanced query. Okay? <clears throat> now, in all fairness, Giroux forsook the adjective balance in part because among the pages he missed is one explaining the original motif and its significance. I don't know if you know what the balance aquarium is. Do you know? What is balance aquarium? Balance aquarium is, a, is, this kind, is an aquarium that maintains a stable ecological system. So you don't need to feed the fish. There is enough plants in the there, there, there are enough plants in the aquarium not to feed the fish at all. Do you see? It's balanced. In other words, it's a self-sufficient system. It's a self-sufficient system. Apparently, they were pretty fashionable. Now, now Giroud missed the page explaining the concept of balance aquarium. He thought there was nothing to it. And he apparently added this prefix on, unbalanced aquarium. <clears throat> so, okay. Let me go on. Finally, so remember, I've talked, about, I've discussed this page, which you missed. I discussed the seven pages, which it seems to us he put aside. And I'll take a minute to discuss the final three pages, which we think he also missed, not put aside, but we, he missed them. He missed the last three pages of the typescript, numbered 26. 27 and 28 and he decided that the material simply broke off on page 25 in all likelihood because these three final pages are misplaced in the collection and have, have wound up in folders where neither the editor nor his researchers if he had any ever thought of looking for them the pages show Lowell almost cured at least understanding the subtle balance that he must seek between, on the one hand, his desire for order, represented by the father figure, and, on the other, his acceptance for disorder, represented by the mother, and Lola is about to be released on the seven pages that we think you be missed. Judged reliable, Lola's returned sharp objects, we see him look back on his past mania with reserve. The shine he gets, one of the things he's returned is, a, is his nail clipper. The shine of his nail clipper, which he now can use at his, at his will, reminds him of his earlier fascination with Mohammed II purifying campaign to clear all Asia Minor and the Balkans of Christian infidels. So, he is reminded of all the monstrous historical figures who are obsessed with purity. He is reminded of how, um, how Mohammed II um, had to, wanted to clear Asia Minor uh, and the Balkans of Christian infidels. He is reminded of other historical figures obsessed with purity. But you can, it's clear that he is not one of them anymore. He is, he is cured and about to be released. Now, quite oddly, um, so those were the pages that he missed. It's very interesting that Giroux incorporated into, it, it, he didn't couldn't find those pages. He, he thought the text was sort of, um, uh, dis, uh, interrupted 
in medias res, and he tacked on bits and pieces he found in Mo's archive. You see, he, found, he tacked onto the text. Here, he found onto the text bits and pieces he found in Lowell's archive to, to concoct something of an ending. To concoct something of, a, of an ending. Quite oddly, for instance, Giroux incorporated into his text a page intended to close Lowell's book devoted to his childhood written later. I don't want to get into those details. But what's, what's probably most important for, for my argument is that he couldn't find those pages. He couldn't find those pages, and those pages show him, uh, show him recovered, low, quite re uh, recovered and sane, and about to be released. In short, without Lowell's final pages, the main story edited by Giroux seems more fragmented, worryingly manic, and abruptly breaking off to become, quite nonsensically, an apology addressed to the father, who in the full text is given a rich and subtle homage. Today, the story is appreciated for reasons which have little to do with the original conception. It's very interesting. One of the things we've done, we've looked into, we've read most of the criticism of Giroux's near the unbalanced Aquarium. And this text is usually complemented not for what Lowell wanted to create. Today the story is appreciated for reasons which have little to do with the original conception. James Atlas, for instance, a well-known critic, wrote the following, Near the unbalanced Aquarium, quote, is a truly harrowing description of insanity. Did you see? A truly harrowing description of insanity. And, quote, Lowell's anecdotes about his madness are vivid hallucinatory and real, okay? That's basically, that's the tone of, 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 of the critic's commentaries. Okay, so this is what got, what got published. I'll tell you what, there are things we will never know. Did Giroux, okay, now th those are important questions. Did Giroux first cut the middle and the eviscerated text in the next step prevented him from recognizing that the three pages were coherent with the text's overall dynamic. You see, he may have cut the middle, and then the three pages may have passed his hands, but he didn't see them as part of the manuscript because he had ceased to see the text as a story of recovery. So he thought those, two, those three pages belonged to different texts. Those pages may have even passed through his hands without him realizing their numbers perfectly <coughs> completed the numbering of the main text. Or did he rather first miss the, he may have missed the final pages, and as a result, he may have misread the text's overall thrust, which led him to cut what he found redundant and misleading. Hard to tell, but one has the impression that one mistake or omission snowballed and triggered others so that the whole structure which Lowell had intended collapsed. Thus, the editor also denies Lowell's autobiographical prose complexity that will later resurface in the poems. It's very interesting that this text seems so manic, whereas some of the poems he later published and are so well known show him recovered and sane. Okay. Why didn't Giroux believe in Lowell's recovery? Why did Giroux think the middle section was cuttable? You see? Why did Giroux think the middle section was cuttable? Well, we think today we think that Giroux had a very ambivalent view of the poet. Giroux's editorial decisions could be explained by some jaundice, or at least by a tendency to ignore as illusory or too transient Lowell's periodic stability and the open-endedness of Lowell's mental condition. Okay? Come to think of it, one can trace a possible pedigree of such a view. 
And let me mention some of those things. Giroud could see, for instance, how difficult it seemed, it was sometimes, to live with the poet. Uh, he had heard stories, for instance, of Lowell's Cambridge 1938 car crash, in which Lowell, drunk, myopic, and distracted, rammed his Packard into a wall with his wife sitting next to him. Giroud rec could recognize for the rest of his life Gene Stafford, this famous writer, had traces of the car crash left on her face as a result of a terrible head injury. Um, Giroud visited Lowell, the Lowells at various stages of their difficult marriage. Giroud could see his wife sinking into depression as she was gradually recognizing that her married life with Lowell was not going to last. It also became Giroud's responsibility to put Lowell's first wife in touch with good psychiatrists. Giroud was the only person who was allowed to see Lowell in his windowless, leather-padded room at Massachusetts Hospital. Giroud witnessed so many crises in Lowell's life, in Lowell's second marriage, caused by the poet's crushes. Lowell would have a crash another woman every, every year. The editor knew everything about Lowell's periodic hospitalizations and about their dramatic circumstances. The editor was deeply embarrassed and threatened with a lawsuit by Lowell's second wife after it turned out that Lowell could not help incorporating quotes and paraphrases of, of Elizabeth's letters in his poems. Giroux had to take care of Lowell when during their outing to an opera house, the poets turned out to have overdosed on a drug. And it goes on and on. So in other words, you see, um, at some point somebody suggested that Lowell should check his levels, his levels of the drug he was taking. And you said, asking him to have the levels checked was absurd. Lowell could not take care of himself in this way. And that's what his editor said, you see? Asking him to have the levels of, his, of the drug he was taking checked <coughs> was absurd. He could not take care of himself in this way. In short, Giroud may have seen too much of Lowell's trouble and of pain his illness had caused to the poets, loved ones, and to friends they both shared to be alert or sensitive to the dynamics of health or partial recovery in the memoir, The Balanced Aquarium. Um, the tumultuous history of Lowell and Giroux's friendship found a curious culmination. Um, what happened was Jean Stafford, shortly before her die, before she died, she, want, she wanted to publish a memoir about, his, about her days with Lowell. His first wife wanted to write a memoir about her days with Lowell. Now, what happened was she suffered from an acute aphasia and she couldn't, she couldn't finish the piece. So um, Robert Giroux began to visit her in the hospital to, to help her finish the piece. And the piece is that stingy critique and satire of Lowell and Lowell's friends, do you see? And she was almost paralyzed, she couldn't write anything. Um, Giroux had to develop an elaborate system of talking to Stafford so as to figure out how she intended to finish the piece. In practical terms, it meant that if he came up with a word or a phrase she liked, he, it was used, that phrase, it was used to patch out the text. You see, so Giroux helped Jean Stafford, Lowell's first wife, finish a satiric text about Lowell. See, a satiric text about Lowell. And the text is very, 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 very memorable for its, for its um, quite unsparing criticism of the poet. Okay, let me just wrap it up and say, time is right for a new edition of Robert Lowell's prose. The Balanced Aquarium, among many other prose pieces, more carefully recollected from the draft pages. 
and closer to the text Lowell had originally envisioned. It should provoke a more nuanced reflection on the relationship between Lowell's prose and poetry. It should provoke, um, it should help read the life studies poems better. And finally, it will show Lowell as more consistently capable of seeking recovery and mental stability, something that Giroux, experienced as he was, would not quite recognize. Okay, and that's my point. Thank you. absolutely fascinating for me, the type of research that you do, but um, I have two questions actually. One is, uh, of course, what you what you described completely changes the, the, um, the, the way this text should be viewed, but in other texts in the collection, are there other extreme cases like this, or is it just, or is it the most yeah. extreme one? No, this, no, I mean, you know, this book's uh, worth and value. Um, hinges on what we call childhood memoir. And this text is completely unknown. It's now it's in 200 pages with footnotes. And, you know, the, the near, near the Unbalanced Aquarium is a text well known. What is not known is the Balanced Aquarium with all the, with all the fragments we recollected from the collection. We found in other, in other boxes or in the box that Jules was using. But of course, well, what we are most proud of of another of the first section of the book, 200 pages of Lowell's memoirs, and those are completely unknown. Um, Giroux, I imagine, you know, the book came out in 1987, 1987, um, when they were celebrating the 100th anniversary of Lowell's, um, no, the 10th anniversary of Lowell's death. And he wanted to have that not uh, that uh, volume ready by then, so he clearly was rushed, and he didn't have, I think, uh, patience. It seems to us he did not have enough patience to go through all the typescripts which we've just done. Uh, it's a large collection, some 300 uh, 320 pages of text that is very difficult to interpret because many pages are um, misplaced. Not in the not in the batch I've just dis, uh, I've just discussed, but in other boxes. The pages are misplaced. The the, the the pages are quite disorderly. We had to read all the all, all over 300 pages, and we had to make sense of how they are interrelated to identify the early drafts, the late drafts, the best drafts. We isolated those and we footnoted them, and I think it will be a big surprise. Uh, for a lot of people, because no one has seen this text yet. And the other thing, you mentioned how careful you are in making sure that it's all right, that, you, that everything, everything uh, sticks together. But do you expect a lot of opposition from I don't know, other uh, scholars, critics, to your volume and people who will defend uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the the current volume? Well, I don't. Ex I don't expect people. Who, I don't expect people will say that Robert Giroux's volume. Um, is better or more important. Uh, rather, I expect some people will say we um, that we've taken liberties when suggesting how the childhood memoir sketches should be arranged in what order. You see, people will say we take. People are likely to say we've taken liberties suggesting how those sketches should be arranged, and which of the sketches are uh, most important or the best. And you know, people will suggest that there may have been some arbitrariness in some of our choices. And we're quite ready for that. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Des. Thank you.